welcome to the LIBD Arstats Club. Today we have Josh Stoltz, who's going to tell us about, um, uh, what was it? Um, lexical scoping um, with R. Um, and um, um, yeah, so thank you, Josh, for volunteering. And uh, go ahead. All right, I'll share my screen here. Okay, so to summarize recently, I've been taking the Johns Hopkins Coursera and I thought maybe it would be useful to present something I learned. So something I learned that we haven't gone over is the concept of lexical scoping. And then in the second half here, uh, using lexical scoping to cache a variable in your environment. Um, so lexical scoping um, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Can you increase the font a little bit, please? Yeah. Just a uh, control plus. That will do it. Do I have to highlight it all? I take it. No. Mm -hmm. Or command plus. Oh. I forget which one. Yeah. Well, that zooms in. So. Yeah. Awesome. That's one way to take care of it. Um, so yeah, lexical scoping is, is just a set of rules for how R finds a variable in the environment. Um, or a symbol, I guess. And so that could be a function as well. It is an inbuilt rule in R, which automatically works at the language level. It is mostly used specifically to, or used to specify statistical calculation. And lexical scoping looks up a symbol based on how functions were nested initially when they were created and not how they were created or called upon. Uh, uh, when we use lexical scoping, we don't have to know the how the function is called and to figure out where the value of the variable will be when looked upon. We only have to look at the function's definition. Um, Shoot, I forgot to put the example in. But we could type it out real quick, right? Um, if we had a equals function of x and y. And then we have z plus x plus y. Um, in this function, we define x and y. However, Z is coming from our environment. We haven't defined it within the function. And so to know what Z is gonna be in our output, that's where you would use lexical scoping to know where is R gonna go to get Z. And the first rule is called name masking. Um, so an easy example here would be with a equals 10, let's see. Dang, now it's covering half. So let me scroll down. And, oh, oh geez. Okay, so in name masking, essentially with the innermost function you're in, it just goes out one to look for that variable. And it will keep doing that until it finds the definition. So here, we're inside one function that does not define A, and then we go out one. And so we can see here, B is 10 and 11. Now, if we did something like C equals eight. We can still see that C is still not eight within the function because by the rule, it's the innermost definition. So since we define C here, it doesn't use this one. All right, and functions and variables. Um, for the most part, to my understanding, 
the rules apply exactly the same with functions. So if we were to do A here, hey Josh, all functions. I had a yeah. quick question. Doing this kind of uh, uh, definition for your function, if you don't have the variable present at the beginning of the script, will it throw an error? Uh, if, if it's not in the environment at all, you mean? Yes. Well, Let's no, it's happens. not at the beginning. So theoretically, you start with a sc clean script. Things that I run into when I'm writing is that you've put a variable in the function and you've forgotten to put it ahead of the function. Does yeah. it need to be ahead of the function? Because obviously it could be below it, but theoretically it would throw an error if it's not defined. Um, it has to be before you call it. So we could put A, for example, down here. And it would work just as well. It has to be defined before you call it, but not before you define it, if that makes sense. Okay. What is there like a reason why you would do this on purpose? I've done it accidentally, but. Um, so kind of second half, I'm getting to that. Um, you would do this in the case that you've done something that takes a long time. So say you're making a correlation matrix for G networks and you wrote a function to go over that. You don't want to have to make the correlation matrix every time you run the function. You can store it in the environment and use scoping rules to just refer back to it. All right, and so for functions, did that answer your question, Kyan? It did get to the point. I'm still gonna, I'm gonna hold out until I see how the Cushing works here in R, okay? Okay, that's fine. All right, um, so for the function here, um, since we've redefined A within the function, it's the same rules as up here. Essentially, this A is invalidated, and this will result in an X plus 10 instead of X times 10. All right, so essentially there, it's our same functions, or the rules for the functions are the same as the rules for the variables. Um, so a fresh start. So every time you run a function, and this is kind of just a general rule in R, every time you run a function, um, it regenerates its own environment. And so just because it was the already referred to, if you rerun that function, so if we do this here to check for Z, so this function uh, defines z as 10, unless z is already present, it adds 10. And I believe we do have, no, we don't. So it should be, it should just be 10. Now, if I go back, I can define z as 10 to start. And without redefining the function, it should be 20 because it, it re-interacts with your environment every time. So you have to be careful about what's already present and defined outside these functions. All right. And dynamic lookup. Uh, I guess I'll just read this definition real quick. Lexical scoping controls where to look for values, not when to look for them. So this kind of comes back to what I was just saying. R looks for the values when the function is executed, not when it is created. The output of the function can be different depending on objects outside its environment. So if we defined here again, a thousand, but then you know you could three or 34, I guess. And 
Oh, I didn't run the X, that's why. Yeah, so each time um, it's referring back to a new environment that you've redefined. And that's, that's kind of the idea of dynamic lookup. All right, so does everyone have the script I sent? Because I have three examples here I wanted us to go over very quickly um, and give you time to work through. And then we'll, I guess we'll do breakout rooms. So essentially here with scripts are the functions one, two, and three here. I wanted people to predict the outcome of the function um, using the rules you just learned in this script. And I think it should be pretty straightforward. Obviously, uh, you could just cheat and run the function and see what the outcome is. Um, but I think that would be a good exercise to try to understand yourself. And then you can kind of chug and plug with numbers to see where these rules and boundaries are before we get into something more complicated. All right, Leo, how do I assign breakout rooms? Uh, <clears throat> so on, the, on Zoom on the bottom, see on the menus, you'll see the, uh, you'll see the breakout rooms option. Um, okay, what do we want? How many people do we have? 10? Yeah, 10 plus you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the link to Josh's code is also from, it's on the Google spreadsheet for the club. Yeah, it's in the chat as well. I don't know if that's the, everybody can see that, but. Uh, no, you had to be on the chat before you sent the link. So people that join afterwards can't see it. Dang. Okay, I'll I'll relink that really quick. Uh, okay, so the second half of this, is we're going to talk about uh, kind of what KJ had had referred us to earlier. Uh, what is the actual function of knowing this? Um, and the idea is that you can almost, you can nest functions in a way that let's say there's a really big variable that would take forever to reload every time you ran the function. Um, you can nest variables in a way that it, it is stored and it won't just rerun the computation every time if it's already there. So the first thing we do is we make our initial function and I'll explain this. What this is gonna do is it's gonna make a list of functions. So it's gonna be stored in a vector, but it's a list of functions. And so let's see here. And I'll go through what this is doing is it's setting up so that when we take the mean of something, we can actually what's called caching I believe that's how you say it. I'm, pro I'm probably mispronouncing it, but caching a mean. So you're storing the mean in the environment. Um, we have, I can probably easier demonstrate what these do and explain them, but the get function will, will get the mean, which will be X. The set mean allows us from outside to assign it within our functions permanently. And then our, here we're making our list. So if we do make, or actually, I think I have an example here. And then secondly, this is where we use the cache. Uh, it's going through and it's saying, if get mean has anything, we're going to use that. If not, we'll get the mean ourselves. So I'll show you an example here. So MVEC, and if we look at it, shoot, um, like I said, it's a, it's a list of, I think, four functions, right? Function one reassigns Y to M. 
and reassigns M as null, so it instantiates it. I'm realizing I have to explain the double arrow. Leo, can you help me here? Um, I hadn't, I forgot to. So the double arrow is when you make an assignment that goes into the global environment. Right, okay. And what I suppose what that does in this sense is it, the, by global, it makes it outside the function, right? or outside that particular environment. So it's yes, not- Yes, outside, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so when we run X is one through four, and we can then run set X, which is going to, if we go back up here, reassign x to be y and m to be null. So we've now instantiated both of these globally. So if you type ls, I think you'll see them. Mm -hmm. mm. Maybe they're in or maybe they inside make uh, and back, I guess. I think so. I think yeah, they're they're within stored within the function actually in this case. All right, so our how do I display this so it's nice to look at? So our get mean function, right? We can check if M has been set and we haven't set the mean yet. So it comes back in null. So now just as a test, we could set the mean to something wrong, right? To see if this works. Get mean, it comes back. 3.4. Now we're running our, our script here. This script is going to check as long as M isn't null, rather than compute the mean, it's just going to use what's already there. Oh, it's on catch. Sorry. So see, now rather had it computed the mean, the mean would have been what? Uh, 3.5, but because it used the one we set, it's 3.4. Um, this is somewhat trivial for the mean of four numbers. However, in other cases, uh, it's much more time consuming. Um, so for example, I think I said taking a correlation matrix or um, inverting a matrix. So taking the inverse of a squared matrix uh, to solve it. So what I wanted you guys to do as an activity is uh, to rewrite the two functions I have above to cache an inverted matrix and I've given you a an example matrix here so we can do data set and I'll show you you can use the solve function to take the inverse of a square matrix um, this is something that's very time consuming on large matrices and or if you could cache it, will make your function run faster. So, all right, I'll put you back in the breakout rooms. I know I went fast through explaining the, the individual steps in this first function I think is difficult. 
uh, to understand what each line does. So as I come into rooms, if you need help, let me know. But we're doing, again, I've given you somewhat of a skeleton here uh, to, to rewrite these two functions, to use the solve function to take the inverse and cache it. All right. Quick, quick question before we go into breakout, mm -hmm. or, or maybe you can think about it after we get out of breakout. There are a handful of caching software in R um, that, that you don't have to write the functions yourself. They just have it pre-built caching. Do you prefer doing it your, by hand or using a caching soft like a package? Um, so I guess I'm actually not familiar with the packages. Uh, okay. So I've only done it by hand. That would be, that would be cool if, uh, if you link those. I guess I've only known about this for like a month now. So um, if, if I, yeah, if you had some packages I could look at, because obviously I could imagine where this would get really hard to, to write out on your own. So that would be yeah. great. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the, the uh, group or something. All right, thanks, Karnan. How do I, all right, let me try to send people in the groups again here. 